Okay. If you would like to follow along with me, I'm going to show you in the CD the lessons. <coughs> the first day of class, I know I mentioned that the lessons in the market are kind of like a cookbook approach. They give you, this is the starting pile. These are all the elements that you need to do this exercise. And they also give you a finished file. This is what it's supposed to look like when you're done. So you have a, a way of comparing and contrasting to see how your project is going your exercise is coming along. And the first exercise through three different parts, A, B, and C. One involves selections and inverting selections and changing values basically so that you can make some parts of the image stand out, look at the text, and also look at the more painted objects and layers. <clears throat> so I'm looking inside using the icon selector here. I could use any one of these. It really doesn't make any difference. And in my CD, it comes with a textbook. Here are all the files. Easiest way if you want to open all of them is click on one. Hold down the shift key and I'll click on the last one. Or if you want to do it by icon, you can lasso around all of them, or you can say select all, command A, select all. And when all of them are selected, you can double click. And um, the other option would be, since I already have a little icon in my dock down below, drag one of them over that icon and it will launch Photoshop and open all of those files. <laughs> all, just about all of the exercises in here are 72 pixels per inch. They are not intended for print, so they're relatively small file sizes. Should open a little quickly. So here we start with the coins and the currency exercise. You'll see that the start file has some coins um, on some paper currency, and then at the end, you'll notice that the one coin stands out and all the rest of them darken. How do you darken everything and keep this one intact? Well, we could do it just the opposite. How do we affect the coin to make it darker, or lighter, or color it, or do something to it, and leave everything else intact? <clears throat> the way we do that are by using a number of different selection tools. And many of the exercises are going to cover different ways of selecting elements in a photograph. And some are pretty obvious, some are not. Some require a combination tool when you know, using more than one. The first tool in our toolbox is the move tool, which allows us to move elements on our page rather than select them. The next series of three tools that we see here are various types of selection tools. You notice that when I hold down on this one, it has a little check mark. You notice that I also have a rectangular selection tool, single row, horizontal, or vertical. There's the lasso tool. There's also the polygonal lasso tool and also the magnetic lasso tool. And we will be using all of these in different exercises. The last group is the magic wand, which will be used in another exercise, as well as the quick selection tool. The quick selection tool is new to CS3. It is the first time the selection tool has been added in many, many versions, and it does a beautiful job. It does a very, very nice job for selecting relatively quickly. And I in quotes, finger quotes, use relatively quickly. Sometimes really fast, other times a little slower, but it still does a nice job of selecting. But anyway, the right tool for the right job, um, because I want to isolate the coin, the coin is circular. So 
circle tool would work. There's different ways of selecting. If I click and I drag with that tool, you'll notice that you see the little marching ants. It's not real prominent. I hope you should see that one. It makes an ellipse. If I want to make it a perfect circle and constrain the proportions, you hold down the shift key. Now, notice it's still hard to isolate or to, to get it wrapped right around the coin, but it's off a little bit. So another key command that we can use before we release the mouse is that when we think we're getting it about the right size, that we also hold down on the space bar and notice that I can move this on the fly move it anywhere on the stage, I can place it where I want it. In the upper right hand, upper left hand corner, go, make it a little bit bigger, and when I get the marching ants to match perfectly, I release the mouse, and then I release any other keys that I have. When I'm done with the selection, I can either move it, like so, and I can move it anywhere else, or I can maybe use my arrow keys on my keyboard, and I can nudge it down, or nudge it up, or nudge it left, nudge it right. You can always fiddle with them. And there's other tools that we, can, that we have available to us that we can change as well. The next step that it wants us to do in this exercise, aside from making a selection, if you pick the right tool for the right job, <coughs> is that we want to darken the outer area. But in fact, what we have selected at the moment is the coin. We don't have the background selected. But sometimes with Photoshop, you will not select the item that you want to change. You will select the opposite, and you'll be able to inverse it. Okay? It, it really depends on the, the, the circumstances. To show you what will happen if I don't inverse it, is that if I go ahead and I go to Edit, I'm sorry, I go to Image Adjustments, and what we want to do is use curves in this particular instance. And I'm going to go ahead and move this down like so, and notice that it darkens it. It darkens the point. I want to darken back. I don't want to darken the point. So I hold down Option key, or Alt key, depending on which platform you work. You notice that it changes from cancel to reset. So then I don't click OK and make the change. If I hold down the option key, click reset, I'm back where I want, and then cancel. Then what I can do is I can go to select and select inverse or shift command I. Now, what has changed? You see not only the selection around the coin, but you see it around the border as well. But one of the things you need to be careful of is that when you're, zoom, when you're zoomed in on a particular item, you don't see the border. So you don't, you, I can't tell from this whether the coin or the background is selected. But if I zoom back out so that I can see everything, then it gives me better perspective as to what's going on. Now I can go back again, image adjustments, use curves, and now watch what happens. When I change it, the background darkens. So now what I've done is I want to affect the background, but what I did first, it was easier to select the coin than the background. But then by just simply using inverse, it protects the coin and it instead selects the, the background. So it really depends on what you're doing and how you want to affect the coin. Um, it can be done any number of ways. Just understanding the tools, understanding how to manipulate them. And using them in various combinations. <clears throat> Using selection tools is done a lot because not only can we change curves, we can change color balance, we can apply effects, we can apply filters, we can do all sorts of things. The only, the, you only want to pick certain parts of an image. You don't want the whole image selected. But how do you isolate those parts? Some, like a little circle, are very easy. Some are more challenging. Some are Maybe you have a picture of a lion with a big furry mane, you know, fuzzy, you know, furry tail and everything. 
and you want to wrench that from the background, it's a jungle, you know, the jungle background, and isolate it and put it someplace else in another picture. Well, how do you select just the line with the fuzzy edge? It's not as simple as selecting a circle. You're going to wind up with some of the background with it. Well, there's other tools available that will aid us in, in doing that. We'll get to it on a later day. Okay? So it's used for lots of things because more often than not with Photoshop, you're not just retouching or editing a single image, you're breaking many images together at one. And that's really what we're going to be doing with our first assignment when we get to that. We're going to bring multiple images together into one image and make it look like a single image. Does that make sense? That's done all the time in advertising. It's done all the time now in film. I mean, somebody will look like the sun is driving down a street near the sunset. And it's actually a combination of scenes all spliced together. You know, and you would never know it. The tools that are available. It's really pretty amazing. So that's one of the things that we're doing. Okay. And when you're done, the easiest way to get rid of the marching hands is to hit Command D or D Select. Command D. Apple D for deselect and they're gone. If I undo Command Z and bring it back, and I just want to hide the marching ants, I don't want to deselect them. Command H for hide. <coughs> Command H to toggle it back. Command D deselects it. So as I'm doing many of these, I'm going to be throwing out key commands because for some things like this, it is helpful to learn those, and they're at that part. When they get into three or four keys, you know, even, I won't say even I, I mean, I don't. It's like, oh man, I'm going to memorize three or four keys. Unless I'm using that tool all the time, then that's a different situation. Okay. So making selections. Um, type. Let's go to, this is the end one. This is part B. So here's one without type. Here's one with type. It really doesn't have much going on here. And I did this the other day, but it's worth repeating. Um, you don't have, because type is a vector object, anytime you use the type tool, it will automatically add a separate layer and put your type on another layer. So you never have to worry about exact placement like you used to years ago. Because that can be really very tricky. I can, don't have to worry about color. I don't have to worry about type style or anything. Just click. And it says Monday is the cleanup day. So I'll type. Monday is beach cleanup day. Okay. Period. And when I'm happy with it, I can either click off the text tool onto the move tool to move it somewhere else, or I can click the checkbox up here. I'm happy with it. I come over to the move tool and click here, and I can move it wherever I want. I want it here. And then I decide, you know what, this isn't the right typeface yet. I need to change it. And maybe I want to change the color. So I go back to the type tool, I'll click inside so you can see that baseline and that little flashing cursor. And I can either change one letter at a time or select them all. I can click and drag to highlight them all. I can go and switch under the fonts from Zappino and pick another typeface. Maybe times would be some more suitable. If I don't like the size, then what I can do is I can switch the size here. And what I'm doing is, is I'm scrubbing back and forth, left and right, and making it larger until it fits the length that I need it. And then when I want a color, remember the other day I said how to, how to pick a color from your, your photograph? It might make it work really pretty nice. Well, let's go ahead and click here. It brings up the color picker. And then what I can do is I can decide, well, maybe I want this blue here. Oh, it's a little too light. How about that gray? It's not that. How about let's just use the same color here, blue. And then select the blue. So I'll have to fix that. It's as easy as that. And you'll notice 
you may not have your layers panel visible, but you'll see that the tool you use it automatically adds a new layer. So this is constantly, this is, can be edited for as long as you wish. It's a very nice feature. What, what tool did you use to change the, the color? Okay. Uh, what tool did I use? When I select, when, you, when the type is selected, I click uh -huh. on this little color box here. It brings up the color picker, and then that's what this is. And set the website colors only for a moment. We don't need that. You can pick from here any of the color in the color spectrum. And slide this around until you find the right color that you want. If you want, you can put in hue, saturation, or brightness percentages, RGB numbers if you have them. If you're working in design for the web, it will tell you the hexadecimal. You can it will tell you, or you can put in the hexadecimal number if you know what it is. Lab colors, or if you're creating for print, and you have uh, a swatch book, and you know what the color callouts are in CMYK, you can go ahead and you can dial those in, so they can be very precise. If you're just for myself, in most cases, if I'm doing something for myself. It's, um, if it's close or if it looks right, that's fine by me. And I really do like moving outside and picking a color from the image. It really works very nicely. It um, relates to all those colors and no one really know why, especially if you pick some little color that's you know, unsuspecting that someplace else that you wouldn't think of. It was from the bench. Just click wherever. And maybe I want the yellow. One of the yellows was from here. Yeah. Orange, more orange. It's up to you. Okay? So it's that simple. Notice that I forgot this, so let's highlight this. Notice it selects the red. Come back and I'm going to pick on the color area pick. Click OK. And I fix it. Okay. And if I want to change it to do more, change the typeface, add effects, layer effects, and add a drop shadow, or make it look like it's beveled, or whatever you can do, just all sorts of things. Move it, select the move tool, and I can move it up or around the wherever I want. So that's type tool. Um, type tool, along with these other tools along here, that are separated by your vector tool. There are various ways of masking an object. Um, lots of different ways of masking. I, I made a selection but with the marching ants, but you can also use shapes on a layer to do that. You notice that this orange pie, in fact, if I let me move layers over here so you can see. There are three layers. <coughs> Um, in this particular exercise. I can isolate just one layer, and you can see that there's a tie layer that exists by itself. This can be served as color and a shape, and it can also serve as a mask for us, which is pretty cool. Um, so that you don't have to worry, like you do in traditional paintings, about painting in the, inside a particular region or or like in the coloring books when you're a kid within the lines. You just don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> so to do that, we're going to select our starter image. And you'll notice that what they've done already is that they have set this layer as a mask. When I hold down the option key and roll between these two layers, you see how the icon changes? You see the little arrow with the double circles? That indicates that what I have here, this <coughs> orange tie, in fact, is a mask to this. Everything on top of it in here will be masked to this. If I want to change that, <coughs> now it is a, now there's three regular layers. <coughs> now look at the difference. I select my brush tool and I can either use the default 13 pixel brush, or I can right click 
and I can bring up a little dialog box and maybe I want a little bit larger one. Don't remember exactly the size of the size of the, um, the book specifies. But even if I don't find it, I'll come in here. Let's pick a nice fuzzy one. That's a good one. Okay. So if I click here, oops, I click green. I don't want green. So I select this button that brings me back to my <coughs> default foreground background colors. And now watch. If I click and I drag it across, hold on. It, I paint it across my whole image. That's not what I wanted to do. It's on a separate layer, so it's not the end of the world. And that's one of the advantages of working with a lot of layers, is that you can protect areas by doing it. Um, but so that you don't have to worry about painting within the lines, I can use that shape as a mask. So to do that, I go back over here between these layers, and I go down to option P, and when I'm between them, I click, and you'll notice that this one is now inset, which means that this layer will be masked by this one. And now watch what happens when I drag across. Click and I drag across. So it automatically protects anything <coughs> inside or outside the layer, which is pretty cool. Come back to my history panel, since I can only undo once. And now we can come back and I can notice that I can, where I can move the, um, my brush and where I can select the color, or, you know, I'm just clicking once <coughs> to make the dots. But I don't have to worry about going outside the lines because they're protected. So there's smart ways and hard ways of working. There's different ways that we could work in there. I can right click to pick a different size brush, and instead of a soft brush, I'm going to pick a hard one, click, and just make some more polka dots. So another thing that we'll get to a lot in this, in this semester are different ways, not only of selecting, but masking and protecting areas, so that it will keep your original images intact. For example, by using other layers, if I decide later on that I really don't want polka, dot, polka dots, I want stripes, I can always turn that off, add another layer, and then put another layer in there with stripes on there. And you have both options. You have not permanently altered the image that lies underneath. Um, it's something that in the commercial art world, and even for yourself, if you're a fine artist, you might want to think about that. You want to think about options of different ways of, of, of coming up with solutions and you know, it's, there's smart ways of working and there are less smart ways that you know, typically want to be able to be flexible. To so not have to redo everything that you, that you just did in order to make some minor changes. And working in layers, working with masks, things like that are ways of protecting your artwork so that you can go back and rebuild <coughs> very easily and make changes. Shows that the CDs 
inside the computer. Okay, we'll click on it. Here's lessons. <coughs> I want lesson two. And it shows. Here's our before and after. Before, the scan photograph. Afterwards, it's been cropped and straightened. We've changed some colors. We've improved color balance, lights and darks, variety of things. If I want to open both, I hold down the shift key and select both, and I double click on one of them. And that opens in the photograph. Very nice. Considerably different, and this is pretty common. To have a photograph that's good, <clears throat> but could use some improvement. Now, the reason it's it's skewed and needs to be cropped and straightened is that does anybody go to um, Costco or a drugstore anymore to have their film developed or have anything developed, even on a CD and it comes back in prints, or does everybody print their own film? <clears throat> I presume everybody prints their own film. Well, some people still do. And then if you wanted to take that print and digitize it, we have the flatbed scanner in the back here. And you would set it on the scanner and you scan it and you digitize it and bring it in the computer. But unless you're, you feel like taking a lot of time and making sure that it's absolutely perfectly square, it really doesn't matter anymore. Um, if it's skewed like this, we can crop it and straighten it very easily. To do that, we select the image and we go to, um, I don't know which one, I don't know where it is. File, automate, is it crop and straighten from here, is it over here, image, adjustments, crop and straighten. You may not be on either one. I'm talking to the next one. Only works when you have solid color backgrounds. <clears throat> if you have a detail, if, if this were on a piece of paper that had a lot of patterns and, and detail behind it, it would be very hard to tell the edge the difference. It would treat it all as part of it. But if I select this now, what it does is it makes a copy of it and notice that it straightens it from the cross. And it leaves your original intact. So if you just want to leave that alone, you can close it or hide it, and we can begin to work on this one. <clears throat> so the, this exercise, for the most part, is still very useful because there's a lot of things that you'll want to do every time you bring an image in. You'll want to adjust the levels, the degree of lightness and darkness. Generally, color can be off. You're going to want to go ahead and tweak that a little bit. You may want to dodge and burn enhance some of the shadow areas or tone some of the shadow areas down, things like that. You'll even notice here, one of the things that we're going to do, and this is one of the things that I showed you the other day briefly, is if we change the yellow tulip, and we thought that this was a bit too much, so we're going to make it more of a red or orange. You know, a lot of things that you can do that may be taken by themselves or the minor, but collectively, when you compare the two, significant difference and the two images. And it, it's not uncommon that this is what the kind of thing that you'll have to do with just about every image you bring into the photo into in, in the Photoshop. So one of the first things that we do is to adjust levels. We can go by the book, which is what I should do, but oftentimes you're not going to have the book to use for reference. So I'm going to try my best to get a really close approximation to this without looking at the numbers in the book. Well, you, when you're doing this, I would use the numbers in the book, but then if you have the time or so inclined, try to do it again on your own and try to do it without looking at the book so that you can get used to trying to fix these things on your own without relying on the book's numbers telling you what I'm sharing. So um, I can go to image adjustments. And I can start by selecting auto levels. And that gets close, but not quite there. It's, it's still pretty far. 
So instead, maybe let's undo this and let's go back and look at command L. That is the, the key command for bringing up levels. And what this little diagram does is it controls the degree of lights and darks that you have. And one of the, the aspects of, of a really good photograph, or one that grabs your eye, is one that has good tonal range, good light lights and good dark darks, and a good range in between. So what I'm going to do is I see that it, right here, it really falls off. And notice that I can punch that up, and boom, that punch that up pretty dramatically. Bring that, maybe punch this up even more, lighten it up just a tad more. Maybe not have this much. I'm going to leave it here for the time being. Push that up. I'm going to leave that, see how that works. Already good contrast. Now, there are better ways to work than this because once I'm done, it's one of my undos that's been used up. There are better ways to, to do this where you can go back and, and fix this if you want at a later time. I cannot, it will be hard for me to undo this and fix it later on. <coughs> the next step will, to, will be to fi fix the color balance. So I can go to image adjustments and go to try auto color. And that does a pretty good job actually right off the bat. It took that color cast out of it. Everybody see that? A bluish cast, more neutral now. So sometimes the auto features don't work too, too badly. They're pretty decent. A little bit of a difference. I could probably lighten this up even a bit more. If I go back to levels, you compare theirs. Close enough. Okay, now, next step. Look at the statue. Um, it, because it's in the distance um, and there's a lot of light hitting it, um, don't have much contrast going on here. So what we can do is that we can use our tools that are really based on traditional darkroom tools. And this is the dodge tool. And we also have the burn tool. Um, the dodge tool will actually um, put pump light into shadowed areas and the burn tool will darken areas. So if I want to lighten areas, let's select that. It's a little, looks kind of like a little cotton ball or something on the end of the stick. I can, do, you know, determine the size. It's, this is way too big. I can right click to pick a smaller one. Maybe 17. That would be great. And then I can come in here and maybe adjust the exposure. Go back and maybe 15, 20% is where I like to start. And then do I want to affect the mid-tone shadows or highlights? Well, right now, I want to pull out some more highlights. So I'm going to pull in here and just go along the edge. Notice how I'm pulling out some of those highlights. Look in this area, along the abdomen. I'm gradually pulling out a little bit. Then if I want, instead, maybe use the burn tool. Again, way too big for the brush. Right click. Again, 17, 21 pixels is fine. If I want to affect just the shadows, I can come back here and I can darken them up just a little bit. 50% is too much. Let's take it down the can for Notice how it's darkening those, so I can really maximize some of the contrast. Before you know it, you keep playing with it, tinkering with it, you have got something that's a little bit more desirable. When you're working with a brush tool, it takes a little bit more artistry to, um, to tinker with it. Uh, anybody have a weapon tablet? Somebody asked if they could bring one. Does it do? Oh, okay. Well, they look pretty neat. Um, 
little tablet that you plug into the USB port and you have a stylus and it's more like working with an actual pen or brush. Not exactly the same, but it's closer than a mouse. Okay. So if you want to bring one, you're welcome to them and we'll install them right on. Um, and the next and almost last step will be to change the color of the file. So to do that, we'll first make a selection because we want to limit the area that we affect. So I'll click and drag with the rectangular selection tool around this tool. Now I can go to image adjustments and select replace color. Um, leave the fuzziness at 34. We're going to add to the selection. And I want to try to get as much of the tool up in here as I can. I'm continuing to click in here and to add. And if I go overboard, let me just back up a little bit. Okay. Now I can come in here and I can adjust you. Notice how I can change the color of it dramatically. I can also adjust the saturation. Do I want to tone it down or make it really brilliant look like a light bulb? I can tone it down just a little bit. I can also affect the lightness or the darkness. And in a very short amount of time, you select, you change the color of your file. Yeah. Um, after you select the, you select the, the area, and then you go image adjustment to face the color. Mm -hmm. Where do you choose the color from? Did you choose it from something or you just? Well, you have to either know and guess, or in this case, the book is going to tell you if you dial in these numbers, this is the one you use. But I guessed. You know, I just went back and forth on the U chart and said, well, this is pretty close. This looks like a pretty close match, and it does. You know, it's close. You have to use your eyes. You know. No, I mean, you, you didn't have an eyedropper tool where you just pick the color? No. You know, no, just. Yeah, you're right. That's the question. The eyedropper tool, no, no, no. Um, Another thing that you can do that you do need to be careful of is you'll notice in this photograph that. Some of the colors in here are pretty intense when you compare the flowers in here. And what they use to do that is instead of the dodge tool, they have something called a sponge tool, like SpongeBob. Um, instead of desaturate, we're going to saturate. And I want to use a pretty good sized brush. I don't know if 50% is good. I'm going to turn it down, maybe 20. And I'm going to now quickly drag on top of and paint on top of the foliage here. And before you know if you do it enough, it actually enhances or intensifies the color. And when you do this on your own, you will notice it pretty dramatically. You can really go overboard and make all of this look too bright, too intense, and it looks a bit odd. Um, you can also switch and go from saturate to desaturate and actually remove color from elements in there by hand. And you see that done in commercials all the time where it looks like a black and white commercial and there's only part of it. There's an image of cereal box and cereal bowl or something that are left in color. That's what they do. They shoot everything in color and then there's a number of tools that they can use. Not Photoshop, but they're Photoshop-like tools that they use to desaturate everything except for you know, certain elements in there. So in a very short amount of time, we really take, I think this, the sculpture needs to be played with a little bit more, but that's okay. I mean, just for demonstration purposes, it shows you what needs to be done. One final thing needs to be done. <clears throat> and that is that when you scan an image, um, with digital images that you pull from a camera, it's not necessarily the case. But when you scan an image, there will always be some blurring that occurs. So what you have to do to correct for that, to crisp up your image just a little bit, is that you'll go to the filter. This is one of the last things that you do. And you'll select sharpen. And then you'll select unsharp mats. And now you can leave the default settings, or you can tinker with this. And notice that when I really push all of this to the max, 
the image looks really very bizarre. Even when I leave that, look at how bizarre. See the difference? How much do you do it? Um, you have to tinkle with it and fiddle with it until you get an amount of mix about right. Oftentimes you can use about 100, 150 percent for 1.5 pixel radius. And actually, when you look in this box and I with a hand and I click on it, you see it in its current state. And when I release, you can see it slightly crisped up a little bit. It's very subtle. So if you stare at it, you'll see it. But if you look at it and say, I don't see any difference, but watch my toggle back and forth. It's just enough for subtle little changes that can make a huge, huge difference. Yeah. What um, menu is that under? In the chart? It's underneath the um, dodge and burn. It's just called the sponge tool. And that allows you to um, either saturate or desaturate an image. <coughs> But when you went to the Unsharp Mask? Oh, Unsharp Mask, that's under um, Filters. Sharpen, Unsharp Mask. So there you have it. In a fairly short amount of time, we were able to take an image that was good, but needed some minor tweaks and collectively um, significant improvement. Any questions? All of my, both of those exercises in demonstrating them go by pretty quickly. Or less than an hour. No questions? Anything I covered the other day or that you were kind of curious about? Maybe you want to know? No? Well, if you have questions, let me know. Um, go ahead and stop the tape here and turn the lights back on for you to work. Okay. You, you said you're going to work at home? Yeah. Yeah, so if anybody's going to work at home, work at home, or free up some computers if you want to work here. You do these exercises, and when you're done with them, have me look at them and I'll check them off. If you want to wait until next week for me to check them off, that's okay too. Don't wait too long.